they go to the body, the commanders kick it. Notice it's not moving, it's lifeless. They get someone to bring a trolley in, put the body on it, and just cart it out. My early childhood was um, one of, of violence and being subjected to beatings. And my dad was just sitting in the house getting bevied all the time. He was on the ale, you know. And he was a bit of a he was a bit of a boxer back in his day. So for me, I wanted to impress him and I wanted to be acknowledged and loved by him. And I joined a boxing club. It was more of a family than the one at home. And I remember running home, excited, telling my dad that I was having a fight. It was my first fight, it was in Waterloo. And he, he was sitting in the front room, smoking a cigarette, with his can of lager by the side of the chair. I was about 12, 13 years old. I said, I'm fighting, Dad. And he just, he didn't even look at me. He just said, if you don't knock him out in the first round, I'm going to knock you out. That's all he said to me. What did boxing mean for you at this time? Boxing, to me, I, you know, I won. I had about 16 fights and, and I won a, a massive majority of them. You know, I had dreams. I wanted to, to join the army. I wanted to, to box for England. And I kind of, like, found myself moving away from it. Because I started finding, you know, friends outside of the gym. The training and the thought of training became a little bit, oh, getting up in the morning, doing that run, going to the gym. You know, I felt like I was missing out all the time. If I don't go, if I go to the gym, I'm going to miss out on this. I'm getting offered joints and drinks and I don't want it, but I feel a need to, to fit in. You picked, a, you picked up a substance, now you're, you know, you need to go and fund the habit that you've developed. And that's what happened for me. You know, when it started small, car stereos, wheel trims, you know, Doing what you do as kids to, to fund these little drug habits that you've got, because we're all skinned. There's no, there's no money, there's no jobs. How old were you the first time you went to jail and what was it for? I was, um, I think it was about 17. It was an attempted robbery. I was uh, hooked by this time on heroin. And I just went out and robbed someone what I tried to, and I get arrested by the police. And you remind me in HMYOY Hinley in Wigan. And I remember sitting in my shell one, 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 one morning and the weather was booming outside, it was dead hot. I thought, I've had enough of this. I can't cope, I can't carry on like this no more. I want to phone my mum, I haven't spoke to my mum for about a year, she doesn't know where I am. I don't think my ma cares, I don't think anyone cares, I'm not getting no letters, I'm not getting no visits. You know, I feel really uh, lonely. That was my mum's number. She answers after a few, a few rings and I said, Mum, it's me, Billy. And as soon as she heard my voice, I could, I could hear the love and then, um, wow, yeah. It, it just it just hit me like a, a ton of bricks, like solid in the chest, and I, I had this 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 overwhelming feeling of like like emotion, and my eyes were welling up, but these two screws were standing next to me, and I thought I cannot blink here. I couldn't even speak to my mum because I knew my voice would tremble, and the tears would just fall down my face, and she knew it was like her mother's instinct. She just said, "Son, I know you're in." Just asked for help, and I went, mm, okay. I just gritted my teeth, I was okay. I just went back to the cell, sat in that cell, and I sobbed. Uh, once that door was shut, I wrote a letter to a probation officer. They came to see me. She said, what can we do? I said, look, I'm on drugs. I want to get off them. I don't want to get out, and I don't want to live the life I'm living. What can you do for me? They said, we can, um, we can put you up in a rehabilitation, up on release. I'd relocated to Bristol. You know, I thought, like, geographically, Liverpool was the problem, and I never understood that the problem lies within. It always has done. So I met this other, this, this kid from Liverpool called Ben, and he'd had five years clean. Now, I had about 
three months under my belt. So him, he was a god. I put him on a pedestal. Five years. How have you stayed clean off heroin and crack cocaine, lad, for five years? And he was just showing me, you know, um, this new way of life. He was you know, full of adventure. He'd been abroad. I thought, I haven't left Liverpool. He's telling me he's going to Thailand. He'd been the year before. Would I like to come? Show me this idea. Show me what a great place it was to be. The food, you know, the culture, everything about it was uh, incredible. And I fell in love with the thought of it. Yeah, we go. Three months backpacking. That was the plan anyway. You know, and I'm like a world class card carrying pleasure seeker. You know, I just want to, you know, experience fun and joy in, in every other way but taking drugs. So I want to relive like lost dreams and I want them to awaken and I love boxing as a kid and you know I love Thai, Muay Thai boxing. I love watching it, I love watching the sport. You know I remember my mate saying to me don't get in the ring with these ties like they'll break your hips. So I got in the ring <laughs> <laughs> and I swear I got my ribs broken within the first two rounds and I learned a lesson and I was resenting the kid who did it and I said, I'll come back. And six weeks later, I got back in and I beat him. You know, and I fell in love with it. Boxing, did that become your kind of predominant thing that you ended up doing in Thailand? Like, was that your main focus? Yeah, boxing was definitely my main focus in Thailand. Um, it kept me there, it gave me purpose. I was disciplined. You know, I was maintaining my recovery. And what it did do was, uh, because I was, you know, because I could, I was, I'd speak English, obviously, and um, we'd walk around with the box and I'd speak to the, the other tourists and say, you know, can we support these boxers because they're putting on a show and they'd give me a little bit of uh, money at the end of the night. And I be I, I, it became a regular thing every single night. I was fighting three, four times a night. But I always fought, even though they were, like, it was show fights to them. I, it was, to me, it was a real fight. You know, I was moving away from like the meetings and recovery and spending more time, you know, with these ties and in the ring and meeting, meeting girls. And I met this girl and I fell in love with her. She couldn't speak a word of English. The relationship was based on a dictionary. You know, and I found out that she had another fella or another partner. <laughs> and I was just so broken and so hurt and so deluded. And uh, all my feelings were all over the place. And, and, and getting in the ring was not the answer. It didn't solve the problem. It didn't take away the pain. And I remember sitting in a bar on my own, staring at this drink. And I said, can I have a double whiskey? He poured it, it's in front of me. You know, you've got to remember, I'm three years abstinence at this, this time, sitting there staring at it. And it's like, I'm fighting with myself. You know, and the f***ers kicked in. And I just picked her up and I drank it and that was it. Picked up the phone, spoke to another foreigner that I knew. He was, he was actively taking drugs and drinking. I told him to meet me. He met up and said, what do you need? I said, cocaine. Came back about five minutes later and gave us these little pink pills with WI on them. What are we going to do with these? They want tablets. Didn't want ecstasy or... Said, no, no, you smoked them, put them on the foil. Started to show us how to do it. Brought a little tube, put it in a mouth, put a little flame under this pill and it just changed. It turned into oil. It started as a bubble and smoke started to come up. It was passed to me. Just, just an air bill. <laughs> wow. I had this feeling that just, just so over, it was just exhilarating. You know, I wanted more. Were you aware of the, the potential consequences of being caught with drugs in Thailand? Because it's quite severe penalties. Do you know what, to be honest, I remember it didn't really hit home when, I'm, when I was buying these drugs and taking them. You know, I felt it was untouchable. I was invincible because the police had pulled you up. 
regular on these motorbikes and you wouldn't be wearing helmets and they'd be taking backhanders off you and you know they were corrupt as you know as as a police force over there is and that's what I thought would happen you know I'd always get away with it as to be fair I started I developed that habit with the yabba right that's it as soon as I pick up I'm using I'm in the grip of addiction I need to fund it fighting wasn't enough I wasn't earning enough money someone offered me a way out is a pack of pills, sell them to the tourist in the clubs. You know, you can use, you can, you can, you can pay us what you need to, and, and and life can be a little bit better for you. So that's what I did, <laughs> and um, big mistake. And when they raided my room, the police they were looking round. I was like, is this like a Rambo movie? What's going on here? There was no windows in this apartment. It was just a dingy little apartment. So I shut the door, sat with me back against it, thinking, oh, you're messing. <sighs> bam, 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 bam. I was getting banged, banged on. I just a bang, 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 bang. Open the door, police. And I went, no, I don't believe you. Throws your ID and I'm stalling and new. Straight away, the police, you know what I mean? An ID card come under the door. I didn't even look at it, I just seen a face. I thought, the fuck? Open the back, put it back, open the door. They've rushed in, had me on the floor, face down, hands behind my back, a little clap, clip around the back of the head. And that was it, I was arrested. You know, and I just thought, that's it, I'm going down. How was that first night in prison and, and how did you feel? I remember going into the cell and it was just shocker with tie inmates. There was about 80 inmates in the cell and it was like a tin of sardines. There was no space whatsoever. And I looked around at all the eyes looking up at me. I had to put that mask on again. I was terrified, you know, but I was acting brave at the same time, like that little bit of a swagger. And I went in, I got ordered to, to sleep in the corner next to this guy who'd passed away. They've got strobe lights on 24 hours a day. You go out in the morning, you know, the sun's hitting you at six, seven in the morning when you get opened up. You're out until about five in the evening. It's still light, you put in your shell. The lights are on in your cell. You've got a hard concrete floor. There's no mattresses. You know, I'm sleeping next to a toilet. You know, people are in and out. There's no privacy. You know, you, and, and, you know, and I'm eating food and it's causing problems in my stomach. And you know, I've got diarrhea and it, I'm sick all the time. I'm still suffering with throttles with these drugs. You know, I'm using on the slight and just, you can't really use anything anywhere. You have to go to really, like the toilets, put a blanket over you. I mean, the toilets outside in the compound where people were selling their bodies, they'd have, they'd have makeshift tents and they'd be selling their bodies for cigarettes and, you know, sticky rice and mango. How were your fellow inmates uh, treating you and, and I suppose how were the guards treating you being a foreigner? Well, I was, um, I was very volatile and reactive and I couldn't communicate with them and that was a struggle and trying to explain to them how I felt and you know telling someone I was feeling sad and I felt lonely and hurt and you know not being able to to convey that to, to them to, to the ties was really difficult and if they speak to me and I could sense they were speaking to me with a bit of venom then I'd react and I'd be fighting with them now the ties they don't fight on their own there's never a one-to-one, -one. they call it Mamu, which is like a pack of dogs. You hit one, they all jump on you. And I had that a few times. And I remember coming out the first morning and getting involved in a fight with these three foreigners, these two Australians and an, and an Iranian. One hit me over the head with a chair, one punched me in the head with these metal rings. I'm biting this other one. I, I'm saying I'm not going. I don't want to go down because I know if I go down, I'm not getting up. The whistle blows, guards come running, they break it up. I've got blood all over me. This kid's got blood all over him. I get taken to the um, the hospital. I'm sitting in this chair. These guys are looking at me and they're laughing at me, and I'm already feeling lousy about what's happened. And I've reacted and I threw a punch at this kid, this Thai medic, 
and then I've been it over the head with a bat. Knocked me out. Um, and I remember um, waking up to this, I thought it was a girl, dabbing cotton wool over these cuts. I thought, wow, she's beautiful. Who is she? I was a lady boy, you know. And with her showing me some compassion and understanding and empathy, you know, it was, it was nice to feel that, that kind of intimacy, if you can understand me. I was transferred to Klong Prem, Bangkok prison after about a year of being in Chiang Mai. In, in Chiang Mai, there was over 4,000 inmates and that was a small prison. When I went to Bangkok, you know, I had 20,000 inmates, so it was, a, it, was a, it was a different kind of a deal there. And I was warned that, you know, Bangkok was a lot more dangerous than, you know, uh, Chiang Mai. Chiang Mai was more forgiven. I remember sitting by this library one afternoon and this young Thai has ran past me. And I seen another Thai running behind him and he had a knife in his hand. The guy with the knife's getting closer. Then suddenly, a Thai next to me has come running out with, you know, it's just a metal chair. I just stopped this kid in his tracks and whacked him right across the face. He's at the floor. This guy's on him and he's stabbing him and it's a, it's a knife. It's not a homemade knife, it's a proper knife. And he's stabbing him. And the death shots, they're going in the neck, they're going in the lungs, they're just, it's just cold, calculated, not in a frenzy, he's just stabbing him in the back, in the legs. And, and the screams were absolutely inhumane. It was, um, it was coming from the, the very you know, depths of his bowel, it was horrible. Um, and I just stood there, like transfixed, I couldn't intervene. It was like it was happening in slow motion. I looked around, the crowd started to gather, it was about 50 people, and they were screaming, calm on, calm on, calm on. And I didn't know what that meant at the time, but I do now, it means kill him. And that's what they were all chanting, kill him, kill him, kill him. And um, these two commanders just casually walked over after the the crowd had dispersed, the guy with the knife had got off. He's on the floor in a pool of blood, I'm still standing there. There's a couple of other foreigners with me. We're all like looking at each other in disbelief. They go to the body, the commanders kick it. Notice it's not moving, it's lifeless. They get someone to bring a trolley in, put the body on it and just cart it out. The Muay Thai boxing, are you able to talk about uh, your experiences with that? I'd had enough, you know, I didn't want to fight in the prison, I didn't want to um, be put in these shells on my own or, or left to rot. I thought I was going to fight back. All the other Thais looked at me, you know, with suspicion and I got a pair of mitts, put them on, started punching away at the bag. And he seemed that he had a few skills. And Taj loved to bet, you know what I mean? So he said, look, we've got a uh, song crown, which is the Thai New Year. I think it's in April. And uh, they have these big shows. You know, I got friendly with the, the boxing coach. He wanted to put me in with one of his best boxers called Pon. I remember getting in the ring that, that afternoon to cheers and applause and, you know, people putting bets on me. And, you know, it was an incredible feeling. And, and I fought that guy and I beat him. And it was um, the respect that he received from the rest of the prison and you know the boxers was um, was heartwarming. The feelings it gave me, you know, it was better than any drug I've ever took. And I'd always like regretted not having a career in boxing. Um, I don't know. It kind of humbled me. It gave me that discipline and that routine. It allowed me to, to face my fears. How, how long in total were you in prison in Thailand and, and what year were you released? I was there three years. I went in 2005, I got released from uh, Thailand, uh, England, September 2010, Wandsworth, London. And how did you feel upon your release? 
I felt um, it was a different it was culture shock. I was finding a struggle to adapt to um, to the UK way of living. I was comparing the price of everything, the people. You know, I was very subservient. It was yes say, no say. You know, I'd beaten, I was beaten down when I was in Thailand. I was, you know, you had to really be below the guard. So everything, even like the the, the, the screws in, in Wandsworth were quite like, look, look, you're here now. I went to, I, they put me in prison in Wandsworth and I, I took away the mattress and slept on the floor. But then I wrote about it. And I thought to me, that was the, the most therapeutic thing I could do was write. Because, you know, I couldn't escape the words on the paper. How did you manage to get back onto a straight path from that point? So, well, to me, it was um, a, like a, a, a detox initially, you know, get off what you was on. I knew there was a way out because I'd been there before. I just had to kind of put this into to, to play, you know, apply it to my life. Get through the detox, get through... Um, get myself back into recovery. I thought, OK, I need to to start, you know, building a bridge to normal living, get a job, you know, get yourself a house, get a car, all the stuff that we're meant to do in life and get, you know, and I think I got it too quick. I wrote a book that became like a bestseller within six months, which was quite bizarre. It, then it became a movie and like, I was overwhelmed with it. Um, the producers and people knocking at my door and ringing me up and actors getting, you know, um, casted for this role and scripts and directors and it was like, oh my, you know, and I didn't know how to deal with it all, you know, and then I get it with cancer, stage three, you know, in the midst of it all. And my dad had just passed away the year before and um, I was put on chemo and I went from 16 stone to 9 stone within 12 weeks, lost all my year. I got a big payout of this, from this movie. Work paid me, even though I couldn't go in. I had credit cards, I had loads of money. I was clean for five years. I hit the road hard on and I spent every penny I had. I thought I was gonna die anyway, I'm gonna go out with a bang. Um, I finished the course of chemo. There was nothing left of me, I lost my house, I lost my car. I went to the oncologist, sat there thinking, OK, I'll accept my demise, this is it. You know, and he went, Mr Moore, you're OK, you, you, you know, glad to say you're going you're gonna to be fine. You've cleared the cancer. And I went, what? What do you mean? I was like, are you having a laugh? I said, I'm all, I owe all kinds of money out and I've got to, he went, calm down. He said, at least you need to pay the bills. And how are you now? Brilliant. They said I couldn't have kids. I've never had children. Um, you know, now I've got a two-year-old. Yeah, so he's a... Yeah, he's a miracle, so, yeah. And uh, forgive me for being emotional, because... Uh, kind of, like... It's always... It's always something that I've wanted in my life is to nurture a little me. Uh, and allow sort of like him to have his choices and 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 you know do what he'd like to do instead of being beaten and battered. And I could never imagine like hating him the way I was hating. You know what I mean? It's given me like that opportunity to to change someone else and bring them up the right way. I had to strip down to next to nothing, grease out, put a towel over the cut section of bar off the window so it wouldn't scratch my back, and levered myself out while Sten wrenched that up just another little inch, probably strangling everybody he'd always hated since childhood, but just enough for me to get out. 